Hey, what's up everybody? My name is The Honest Batcher. Welcome to the HB Half Hour. This week we actually have a completely different setup going on. Uh, I'm about to go on a vacation and so instead we're having a long form interview with Josh Robert Thompson. He's an actor, he's a comedian, and he's from Family Guy. So we're going to be talking about a few different things so you can get to know him and then hopefully you guys have fun hearing what we talk about. All right, so we're here with Josh Robert Thompson. He is from Family Guy. He's an actor and a comedian. So first off, I wanted to start the interview just by uh, getting people to know you a little bit better. And we'll do a long-form interview at some point, uh, kind of going more in detail. But tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, you know, I started out doing a lot of voice acting. And um, yeah, Family Guy I've been doing for about seven years now. And uh, and then I did the Late Late Show with Craig Ferguson. That was a late night show. I did that for about eight years. I was his talking robot sidekick for all you grandmas that are watching out there. <laughs> You're probably very excited right now. Oh, I know that show. What was the demographics of that show? Oh, I think it was 80 and up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> just the target know. audience you know if you're looking for longevity in hollywood that's the way to do yeah. it yeah <laughs> no it's uh, people are very nice and they still bring it up now and again hey you were jeff the robot and then, then they'll immediately say my grandma loved that show so. <laughs> and then it's <laughs> ruined <laughs> it makes me feel good so <laughs> at any point in your career have you been a in front of the camera kind of guy or have you always just kind of laid behind the scenes just using your oh, voice yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, um, my history in public access TV, you know, doing television way back 98 is yeah, when I yeah. started. It was all on camera. None of it was voiceover stuff. Um, hosting things, hosting shows, playing characters. That's really what I want to do. I mean, that's kind of why I made the pilot, because I thought, well, I don't really want to be behind the microphone for the rest of my life. It's great work, by the way, and I'll take it whenever it comes my way. So, yeah. but... I kind of do enjoy that more. Do you feel uh, a little bit less pressure it just being your voice versus, you know, acting is so much of facial expressions and your body movements and body language where it's just your voice. I actually find it to be harder, I really? think. Because, yeah, because you, you only have your voice. It's actually harder to make a character and a performance that's believable as a voice actor because all you have is your voice. You can't nobody sees you so you have to paint a complete character that way I think it, it, visually I can move and get more into the character and then feed off the other actors also the thing about voice acting especially like Family Guy there's nobody else there when you're doing your lines That's so you true. don't have anybody to play off of yeah that'd be so weird. you kind of have to just pretend you know yeah um, that would that, like, timing wise I feel like that would be very yeah. difficult yeah it all comes together in the editing I mean it's like you know making a Star Wars, a George Lucas uh, green screen, you know, all right, so there's going to be a giant sort of ape creature <laughs> that might be, it'll be an ape, we might replace it, I don't know, but just sort of look over there and kind of be upset. All right, let's let's do a first take here. You know, like, what? That's how you feel most of the time. I was thinking about something, um, like, obviously you can do a lot of voices. How many impressions can you do, by the way? I, you know, if people ask me that, some guy asked me that, I don't really, I don't really keep track. I, I think, you know what it is, is, uh, if I'm given enough time, I think I can match most people. Yeah. Because um, that's one of my one of my jobs is doing voice matching for movies. So like, if an actor like Morgan Freeman is not available to replace certain okay. lines of dialogue, then they call somebody like me. Right. Uh, so I just uh, auditioned for Ted Levine for something. <laughs> I don't know if I got it or not, but. Yeah, Tim Levine, just kind of down here. Hey, what are you guys doing over there? Hey. That's like a weird voice that most people don't know. Um, but I like that. I kind of yeah. like discovering that stuff. So I don't know. Well, how'd you decide on your talking voice since you can do so many voices? Like, how'd you pick that one out? This one? Yeah. That's a bad choice. I, I wondered that myself. <laughs> All right. Well, you sent me a few topics that you wanted to cover. Um, all of them sounded yeah. very interesting to me. I guess the audience will be the, the judge of that. Um, but one of the things that was most interesting to me was the current state of comedy right now. Uh, it was the current state of comedy as it relates to our new offended culture. Now, sure. I was actually just having this conversation. Do you think that people are getting more or less offended these days by jokes? Yeah, I mean, I feel like most of this... Um outrage is is uh is only online mm -hmm. i don't really see a lot of this in the real world if you want to call it that i mean right. if you go to comedy clubs there aren't a lot of people that are standing up 
during a show and saying, this is offensive, I'm leaving. It does happen. Yeah. But in comedy clubs, you mostly see people of all walks of life making fun of one another. Yeah. And uh, no one seems to really care. So. Yeah, it's almost like there's a thirst for offensive content at this point. And that's why you're seeing, like, at least from my observation, a lot of conservative comedians are starting to take off. Uh, because now they're fighting for free speech, which is, which is ironic. Um, and people are like, I really need to see, hear some nasty shit. Like, it would be really nice to hear some nasty stuff for once. Yeah, I mean, I think I sort of wrestled with this for a while with the uh, TV pilot that I made a couple years ago, which uh, at one point depicts two puppets uh, f- <laughs> and uh, And recently, Brian Henson... Uh, uh, announced that he's made a film which is an R-rated comedy starring puppets that have sex. In fact, the end of that trailer is a puppet reaching orgasm and shooting what is essentially silly string out of his (laughs) and the scene goes on for about 30 seconds. And all I could think was, okay, maybe there's a chance now. I think that people are probably tired now of the outrage culture in terms of comedy and also people get really annoyed when when you talk about social media on stage i think yeah I think and annoying. uber uber and lyft yeah like you guys ever been on twitter and like people <laughs> favorite around your tweet you ever notice that and it's just like oh my god shut the f-. like <laughs> even back in the day when guys would talk people people on stage would talk about myspace you could hear a collective groan so, oh god it's almost just an embarrassing thing that we don't really want to talk about, but we're all on it and we all we're all obsessed with it. That's actually changed a lot, though. Social media has changed the way that we tell jokes, uh, the way that jokes are written, the kinds of jokes that are out there. There's just so many people that are hilarious now that it's all over the place. Saturation. Right, right. Well, it has opened up other avenues for being funny. Like you have the whole meme comedians, which I actually have a lot of respect. If you can turn one sentence in a picture into a joke that actually makes me laugh out loud, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, I had to get over that crotchety old man, get off my lawn syndrome. Like, <laughs> you know, I mean, on one hand, so there's people that are working really hard to try to write shows and craft jokes. But hey, a joke is a joke. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It makes you laugh. Well, it kind of goes into the next topic pretty well. Uh, I think what's really difficult, and you got on to live stream, I think pretty early on in the thing. What's difficult about live stream is you're not getting audible feedback on what you're saying, and you're yeah. also getting instant feedback on whether or not your joke is funny at all, but with right. a deadpan you know, text. Uh, so you, you say it was a mistake for you. Why do you say it was a mistake? I think... I think that I was coming from traditional media. I was coming from network television Mm -hmm. and jumping into the world of live streaming, which is really just kind of an anything goes situation. It's mostly, as I've said before, um, preacher, wannabe preachers, uh, ex-biker chicks with uh, (laughs) droopy tattoos and a drink and a schlitz and then cam girls. And we're specifically talking about Periscope and or Twitter Live, which has just devolved into a storm of uh, white trashery. That's Mm -hmm. what I would call it. But, you know. I think what's tough for you is you actually had a reputation to protect in a way. Uh, for me, it was like uh, all all bets are off. I could do whatever the hell I wanted. I was doing parodies of cam girls. I at one point this this isn't something that I did on my main account, but I drew a face on the tip of my penis and started yeah. talking to people with the penis hole. Um, so, which, which by the way is a, is a, <clears throat> was a, a gag that was done years ago. Was it <laughs> in a parody movie called uh, the Boob Tube? Or Groove Tube, sorry, The Groove Tube, <laughs> which is a classic film. So Chevy Chase yeah. is in it. There's a lot of people in that film, but some guy upside down uh, balls and penis <laughs> little, put little beady eyes on the testicles and just sort of undulated his <laughs> and kind of had a conversation. It looked like an elephant basically talking. 
Oh wow, he showed more than, than I was willing to you know, show. <laughs> you were you were sort of following in the footsteps of the greats, but you made a good point a while ago, and you kind of jokingly said uh, to me, you said, "I don't even know why you're even on there at this point, or I don't even know why you acknowledge these people at all." Yeah, and you yeah. were right. And for me, I admire somebody like you, and in fact, I in a way envy a lot of the people that live stream because they don't have anything to lose; they can just kind of do whatever it is that they want. And yeah. At a certain point, I had to stop, and it's we're here. We are talking about freedom of speech, and I should be on stage and say whatever I want. But that's a different environment. It's just different because people aren't recording every thing, single thing you say, and it's just it, somehow I had more to lose. I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is very tough. Uh, like I know, I know perfectly well that at some point the things that I say on here could come back to bite me if I try to go back into the the corporate type world. Right. Um, but I've already decided that, you know, not that YouTube is going to be what makes everything take off, but I've already decided that I just don't care. I'd rather say how I feel about the things that I feel than right. be uh, shut down. See, and then for me, I think ahead to, well, maybe maybe I'd like to, uh, I'll have an opportunity to do voices more for Pixar or Disney or maybe Nickelodeon. I'll get on a show and then people say hey yeah but did you see this stuff that Josh said on yeah. uh, live streaming and then oh we won't we don't want you on our show anymore you know that that's yeah. what I'm was concerned about when companies um, are such now they're not even willing yeah. to deal with anything at all it's like what people want to boycott it's like eight people and they're like oh people are boycotting well we, let's just kick him off and it's like no, oh. I, I agree and I have sort of an identity crisis as a performer because I do love ranting I do love talking about controversial subjects my pilot could be considered offensive to some people I like R-rated comedy but then there's the other side of me that enjoys uh, Jim Henson and I like to work on different shows I have worked for Disney a lot so I sort of want to be able to have the best of both and I think you can it's just trickier now uh, the way that things are currently yeah That's unfortunately in Hollywood it's all about um, basically laying low all the yeah. way throughout your career and then once you're huge now it's like all right well here's the real me and I'm a pervert and I'm all like not not to allude to any of the me too movement kind of stuff going on but uh, now you now you get to actually express the whole um, spectrum of your humor. You can't do right. that early well, that's, on. That's a good point you make because Chris Chris D'Elia, I think, is uh, a very funny guy. Has a great podcast, and he says things. He, he I've seen him say things that I've already said on Periscope, but it's Chris D'Elia, so people just go, "Oh well, yeah, but he's hilarious, and it's he's already famous." And I yeah. feel like there's a little bit more leeway there. Whereas if I say it, people go, this this guy, Josh Robert Thompson, he's an angry nobody, man, loser. There is a, there is a difference. Yeah. It is reality. Yeah, you hear like Louis C.K. drop the N-word sometimes in a, in a very casual, perfectly okay contextual man manner. But you're like, why the hell does he get to do that? I mean, he is half Mexican, but he's white as hell. Uh. <laughs> yeah. No, but there is that thing. It's like, yeah, well, yeah but he they can say it, but you can't say it until – You've proven to the world that you're super famous, and then you can say whatever you want. But even Morgan Freeman can't say whatever he wants, apparently. <laughs> Did you read what he actually is being accused of? No, um, I sort of read a couple of things about a production assistant, and uh -huh. let me see your panties, let me look under your dress or something. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Again, uh, you know, I know what's funny, uh, fans, people that follow me, they're, you're the worst because there, there's immediately I woke up when the news broke about Morgan Freeman and everybody was saying, yeah, dude, do video. Just just start. Just do a parody. Just post it. Don't worry about it. And it's like, well, yeah, again, we have nothing to lose. You gotta, I, like, you gotta think that I've done voice work for him so many times in the past. You know, that's going to come back. And then some other guy will take it from me. So they'll replace me with some other dude. And then that's it, then I'm screwed. But at least you'll be entertained. Yeah. CNN, it says exclusive, eight women accuse Morgan Freeman of inappropriate behavior. Okay. And then uh, <laughs> this guy posted that and said, well, there goes Josh R. Thompson's career. <laughs> that's all you had. Why? What the hell, man? <laughs> I guess that's it. Hey, as long as you're synonymous with Morgan Freeman, you're doing okay. 
I think honestly, I think this is now my chance to take over for Morgan Freeman. Exactly. Is, nobody seems to be. Josh, I'm not going to be able to do this anymore. Um, could you take the heat? I'll take the heat for you, Morgan. I'll <laughs> pull into these shows as you, which I think I'll probably be doing very soon. Yes, please. Do you think this is a good time or a bad time for a straight white dude to make a show and try to release it? I don't know. I thought I thought that that might have been the problem initially. Well, the real problem is I'm a straight white unknown male. I think that's the the keyword is unknown. Right. Um, Cuz you have to emerge. Hard, yeah, it's hard to sell a show if you don't have a massive online following or uh you're not a celebrity. That's just a fact. Mm -hmm. uh, I use Bill Hader as an example because he has a great new show out called Barry, which yeah, yeah. is on HBO. Now, Barry is tremendously well written. It's a great character, it's a great concept. Um, I don't think it would have happened without Bill Hader. Well, no, that's a good point because, like, for example, Sausage Party, that movie would never have been made if it wasn't Seth Rogen and James Franco. Yeah. It's a ridiculous concept. Actually, this is kind of, uh, I mean, it's on subject, but it's uh, kind of a uh, random tangent. But uh, I was listening to an interview with Seth and James, and they were talking about how what they did at first is they sent in the movie as offensive as possible. And so then the studio contacts them. They're like, okay, you got to remove that. Well, so one of the characters, I think it was a PETA, he had balls as his chin, and they looked like just straight up nuts. And uh, they were hairy. So the studio sent it back and said, remove the hair and we're good to go. And wow. so, yeah, so they got they got away with a lot more than they would have uh, because they went as offensive as possible. So maybe your show, because it's pretty damn offensive, I think, uh, I guess if that's a, a thing. Some of it, I think yeah. uh, the one thing I did cut out, I did go back and cut it out uh, because I received some notes. I can't say the network. There is a network looking at it, another awesome. one right now. And they said, yeah, if you could just get rid of the blackface part great <laughs> and i said i got no problem with that um i had to put it out there though <laughs> well i didn't the thing is um that show was a free-for-all just an unscripted free-for-all and the day that we shot this theater sequence i had just everybody i knew that was an actor or performer come to this theater they were mm -hmm. all lined up outside and one after the other they'd come in with whatever idea they had and we would just shoot it and that's how it happened. And my friend Robert Thompson, no relation, is a kid I've known for years from public access days. And he went up and did four or five characters, one of them being, I thought, a very funny old-timey vaudevillian guy who <laughs> has no idea about social cues uh, or our current era, and he puts on blackface. But it just wasn't, we just couldn't make it that, it wasn't that funny. If it was super hilarious, would have pushed I would have it a little left harder. It in, but I got no problem cutting it out. But I will say there's a lot of great female performers in my show, people that have gone on to big shows. Like Dana DiLorenzo was on Ash vs. Evil Dead after the pilot. Melissa Villasenor, I already mentioned. Rachel mm -hmm. Butera is now on the new Rocky and Bullwinkle, uh, along with the guy Piat Michael, who is also on Rocky and Bullwinkle. So I feel like there's a nice, diverse cast of people. And and not uh, and when it wasn't on purpose. It was just I picked the people that I thought were right for the job. Yeah, it's kind of uh, SNL style. Come in with your sketch yeah. and see how it goes. Yeah. So and you know what's funny, man, is now I think it's it's been three plus years since we made the pilot. Um, since all those people went on to great things, now we use that as a selling point. Now it yeah. makes the selling even stronger. Uh, and so I think it all worked out. So we'll see what happens. Well, and then you can re, uh, retroactively make it sound like they took off because of your show. And Yeah, that's kind of, yeah, you know, guys, <laughs> I discovered them. And without this show, I really don't think they would have had that shot. And then they'll say, <laughs> okay, so why haven't you been doing anything since the, well, that's really, <laughs> let's not talk about that. I, no, but I have. I mean, come on. <laughs> well, uh, you know, just not in front of the camera. That's true. You know, that's funny, man. I, I'm glad you brought that up because I think people, a lot of people have this idea and they'll say things like, have you been in anything I would know, though? Or have yes. you done anything that everybody would know? <laughs> well, maybe not, but I've done things that pay the bills. And uh, there's a lot of working actors in this business that you'll never hear of. 
and they make very nice livings and for them they make a nice living for themselves and that's that's it i mean you don't have to be in these giant films in order to make money so well i'm like i do a little bit of acting i'm actually terrified of the fame aspect i just want the money aspect the fame doesn't sound that great that sounds no. terrible actually no i've never i'm i'm not i think people sometimes get confused when i speak about these things i i just would love to sell my show and be able to come to work every day, drive on the lot, and be able to work with this team that I worked with. That would be great, every day to come on the set and create right. new stuff. That's it, I don't really care if I'm famous. It does yeah. sound terrible, especially now. <laughs> Sounds very bad. No kidding. But yeah, uh, I think that, that, that fame is just a substitute word for rich. Um, and so, yeah. it's like, nah, I don't actually, I don't actually want people to, uh, I don't want to be incapable of going outside and having a normal day. Uh, right. but, but I will take the money that goes with it, and if I happen to be famous too, then I'll just consider that part of the deal. I dressed up as George Lucas once for a Star Wars convention. I saw that. But... Dude, I'm under all this makeup with the gizzard and the wig, and oh, I'm George Lucas. You know, I could not move uh, a foot, and every time I tried to walk, hundreds of people would gather around me and want a photo, and it was great. It was awesome. But about an hour in, I was ready to take my life. I thought, oh my god, and then I got angry because I thought, wait a minute, they only want to talk to me because I look like George Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> is under here You're having an identity crisis right <laughs> yeah so but no I, I it would that would be a nightmare man um so you you mentioned something about how people are basically mired in the past they're always bringing up your past because they take screenshots and that stuff lives forever and that's so true because you'll see a lot of people like for example not to get political but there's this lady gina haspel uh she was involved in the fbi program back when they would waterboard people and at the time that it was happening, that was totally okay. But people are like, yeah, but you did that, and now we know it's not okay, and so now we are going to just completely destroy you for it. Right. And that's just so prevalent now. Like, if you were to make a joke that was perfectly acceptable back in the 70s, it comes back to bite you now, which is insane to me. Well, this happened to a friend of mine, Melissa Villasenora, who's now on uh, Saturday Night Live as one of the main cast members. Mm -hmm. She was in my pilot. I've known her for a number of years. And, you know, people, there are a lot of people out there that are just waiting to ruin your happy moment. And when she got the news and it was announced that she was one of the new cast members on SNL, right away, a bunch of people poured over her tweets until they went five years back and found some offensive jokes that she had made uh, about some something. I don't remember what the jokes were. Screenshot them, articles were written about it, and there was a concerted effort to stop this person from realizing their dream, which I thought was utter bull because there's a difference between, oh, we found out that you murdered somebody years ago, and oh, you, you tweeted some joke. It's a huge difference. I mean, and it depressed me. And such an incredible amount of power they're giving to these trolls. Uh, yes. there, there's no one more powerful right now uh, than the offended. Yeah, and uh, and that's kind of the reason I stopped uh, live streaming, just because I think for me I realized I was wasting my energy on dealing with these people. And also, yeah, I realize what people say doesn't matter and – you know, people can criticize me. I don't really care about people that criticize me. I used to get really upset about it and focus on it a lot. I mean, it's true. I did. Um, and look, when you have that many people coming at you like that, I'm just one of those people that probably shouldn't put themselves in that position. That's not how it works when you're working on a movie or a TV show or even when you're in a comedy club. Yes, you get the occasional heckler, but that would be like the entire audience speaking through their minds into your head it's during maddening. a performance. Okay. And, uh, you know, if you don't need it, then cut it out. You don't have to deal with it. But you, you mentioned uh, getting heckled. So you had an issue a few years back with a heckler? I did, yeah. It was, uh, I don't know, the video was actually, I made it to World Star, so I feel hey. pretty, pretty good about myself. <laughs> that was, And the irony is I thought that, well, at least this very low moment in my life has made it to World Star. So surely this must advance me to the next level. No, that that didn't work out. But it was some drunken 
a girl who it was at a bar in Pomona. So already the elements were in place for a disaster. Pomona is thinking, very, very heavy Latino for those who don't know about Pomona. <laughs> it is, yeah. yeah. What's up, man? What's going on? Yeah. Let's go watch this comedy show. What's up, bitch? <laughs> no, I love Pomona. Pomona's, um, I, I lived near there in a city called Claremont, and Pomona's very, okay. uh, you know, they have a lot of art galleries, and downtown's yeah. really cool, but they had this crazy, weird bar, and I did the stand up there, and this girl was drinking heavily and decided to come on stage and take the microphone from me, and I got really pissed off. Um, she threw a glass of wine at me and then picked up a folding chair and threw that at me as well. And the entire time I kept thinking, well, I'd really love to push her off this stage. And by stage, it was like a pallet, basically standing on a pallet in the corner <laughs> of the room. But I thought, and then I looked around and there was just a sea of people with their phones. Yeah. All, it was just like waiting to see what I was gonna do. Right. Um, but despite that, the video was posted. I posted the video because I thought I'm going to go viral. This is going to be huge. That's how that's how bad things got for me at one point. I thought <laughs> this is it. Nothing else is working out. This is the way. I got very few views on my account, but the World Star one got like 80 billion views and then I didn't even get a credit for it. And then people found out it was me and they were like, "How dare you?" Uh, uh, slightly push that girl even even just a little bit and I thought okay I can't I want no part of this I mean I wasn't gonna hit her D despite anything I wasn't gonna hit her just didn't wasn't gonna happen well I, I would have been pissed if I, did, I didn't uh, think of this but uh, Hank Azaria what do you think of uh, him stepping down as Apu yeah we that's right um you know uh, this, it, it, I was thinking about this, and I, I'm glad you brought it up because as it relates to the pilot that I made, because on my show I play, or not just my pilot, my characters are a talking Mexican raccoon. Mm -hmm. Hey, what's up, <laughs> Snorky Lopez? What's going on? Uh, Darnell Jenkins, who is basically a Boglin puppet. Hey, what's up, y'all? Darnell Jenkins. Hell yeah. Ah. Right? <laughs> and, and then there's... Uh, the Indian doctor, I don't know where he is, Doc, Dr. Singer Dick. I know this is Dr. Singer Dick, and I would like to let you know that uh, I'll be giving a seminar this weekend. And so I do all of those voices, and I, I do not feel that it's offensive. I realize I'm a white man, but I am not doing those voices with any kind of spite or hatred, and they're characters I came up with. Right. And I, I don't. I would never, ever want someone else to take over those voices for me. Um, right. The the Hank Azaria Apu thing is also very strange to me because it, in in the time since The Simpsons started, there have been so many incredible uh, performers, uh, Indian uh, of this that have come out that are, have their own shows and that do great right. stuff and stand up. I, I don't, I, I don't see it. Maybe I'm missing it. And I did watch the documentary and I don't remember his name, the, the guy that made the documentary. Um, but even he has said that he doesn't feel that Hank needs to step down. Really? Yeah. I, I, I may be incorrect, but I have seen this several places where he said he doesn't feel that Hank needs to stop doing the voice. It's just that the character should change but the character is a successful he's like an American success story I don't really understand that's what I feel yeah and I don't know I don't know I and, and Hank is in a really tough spot and I understand why he went on Colbert and said that he gets it and he would be willing to step down I don't think he said he would step down or is going to but he'd be willing to step aside yeah uh, but he has to say that. I mean, also, Hank is promoting season two of his new show on IFC, so. Oh, well, now it all makes sense. <laughs> Something to remember. <laughs> yeah, well, and it, it goes back to one of the things that we were talking about earlier, how, like, since everything's screenshot and saved, people are mired in the past. So, like, now maybe today it feels like racial tensions are high. But at that time, you could make fun of, like, the b the bumblebee, the Mexican bumblebee, and then uh, Apu, yeah. the ridiculous Indian character, and then there's uh, black characters and Christian characters. Like, no, like it, I just don't understand why you get to pick to be offended by one when he does so many. 
Yeah, I mean, maybe I'm maybe I'm not maybe I'm not getting it. Maybe I need to hear more uh, other perspectives. Honestly, I just I'm not. I feel weird talking about it because it's and I hate that I feel weird talking about it. It's like, yeah, but you're a straight white guy, so why should you be able to talk about it? I'm not even trying to denigrate anybody or take anybody down. I'm just as a voice actor, just as a voice actor, um, I get concerned about. Geez, am I gonna? Am I gonna lose my job? Are people gonna just like when I do Morgan Freeman? Uh, recently, in the last year, I, I've auditioned for four or five gigs as Morgan Freeman, and I didn't get them. And somebody mentioned that they're trying to give it to people that are African American, and I thought, but right. Morgan Freeman himself, <laughs> like, who else does? What are you talking about? That doesn't make any. Because is that racist? If I do Morgan Freeman's voice and he's black, then I guess I'm racist. But that's not. That's just a voice. So right. How do we make that delineation? I don't. I don't understand that. Well, as soon as we are more considerate of people's identity versus who's the best, that's when we run into some massive problems. That's the thing. I can talk like Morgan Freeman. I'm sorry that you can't. All right, so what do you have What do you have that you're working on right now that you can mention for people um, to check out? Besides your pilot, of course, everybody should check out the pilot. Uh, yeah, you have it up on is, jrtshow.com? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, jrtshow. I'm just kidding. The jrtshow.com. <laughs> but it is, it's on my uh, Twitter. It's pinned. Okay. It's, the, it's the most expensive tweet of all time. Uh, it's a $120,000 tweet. I knew it would end up online. I knew it. <laughs> and but it's I, at, at Josh R. Thompson on yeah. Twitter. And then the JRTShow.com. They can That's also check it out there, I assume. Um, so I'm getting ready to do <clears throat> season two of my podcast. It's been a long time since I've done another uh, season of that or any podcast. Awesome. And um, it's going to be more of the same weird characters and imp improvised uh, stories. A lot more L. Ron Hubbard lectures, which I'm excited about. Yes, please. Um, and then I started um, working with a friend of mine who is a writer and starting to do some new web series involving the puppets and green screen. And I've been doing a lot of testing, figuring out how to put the puppets in with me at the same time. And I have some great footage of me sort of hosting and having a conversation with Snorky Lopez and Darnell at the same time. Yeah. Um, and it's been really fun, man. It's kind of like getting back to the public access routes, but using current technology and then pushing it forward. And I, I'm really excited. Also, Reverend Apostle BG, uh, there's another project I'm working on with him that I think uh, will probably be the next big thing that I do. So maybe there'll be a crowdfunding thing. Oh, there he goes, asking for our money again. How I'll never understand that. <laughs> okay, I want to thank Josh Robert Thompson for coming on the show this week for a special kind of interview edition. We'll have a regular show for you next week. Make sure that you check that out. Make sure you watch all the previous episodes. Make sure that you help fund the show. Everything goes right back in the show. Cash app, Venmo. Like, subscribe, comment. But that's going to do it. See you guys next week.